The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship. We um, just got back yesterday from Wichita in the Synod Assembly. I know that's exciting news for you. <laughs> and I thank those people that, it's not announcement times, but I thank those people that went. Uh, Lisa and Carl, um, Westland and Nancy and Mike Holman. Mick and I were there, of course. Lee, and then Erica Youngquist, one of our youth, was there. And I think it was an inspiring time. I think they spent their time trying to make it an inspiring time, and it was. Our by the way, we have some visitors in the back pew who are from New Bronzefels, do I have it right? Texas, Peace Lutheran. They, they spent the night over at the King's house, so be sure to greet them. Our text today, the Gospel text, is Jesus raising the son of the widow of Nain, and we'll find out what that means for us and how it impacts our life. We, let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead, showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing and life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds, forgive us our sins, and free us to love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Apostle Paul assures us, When we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sins to the cross. Jesus says to you, Your sins are forgiven. Be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for you. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. And also with you. Compassionate God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Places 
that I've tried to hide. Lead me to the truth that will set me free. Wash me in your water, fill me with your spirit, raise me in your love as a child. Wash me in your water, fill me with your spirit. reading from 1 Kings. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you done against me, O man of God? What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my, son, my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom and carried him up up into the upper chamber where he was lodging and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again and he was revived. Elijah took the child brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your, in your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Galatians. For I want you to... For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who set me apart before I was born and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son to me so that I might proclaim Him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then after three years I did go to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a, call, uh, to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. Good morning. Hi. I have some greeting cards. Do you ever get cards in the mail? This one quotes Leo Tolstoy. Love all the earth, every ray of God's light, every grain of sand or blade of grass, everything. Love the earth. And then it says... It's your birthday. Celebrate with love and laughter. Isn't that kind of nice? And then this one. It's a Christmas card. It just has a woman with a baby. And it says, on Christmas, the impossible became possible. Be astounded again by the story of our Savior's birth. I like that. The impossible became possible. This is my favorite. It's just a picture of a dining room table, and it says miracles. For a moment our eyes see and our ears can hear that there is about us always miracles. And then it says, you're one of God's miracles, happy birthday. Well, we, I read about a miracle today in the gospel lesson. Jesus touched, well, it, it was a, 
have you seen those stretch, stretchers that uh, the EMTs, the guys in the ambulance carry people with? This was sort of a stretcher like that. The only problem is the person on the stretcher was not alive. And Jesus says, young man, rise. And he sat up and he was alive. Do you know what you call that? A miracle. And it means for us, for you and I, if I can quote our bishop from this, from the assembly, he said, stories like that mean we're stuck. We're stuck with the re resurrection. So resurrection, God visits us with the resurrection to help us in our lives every day. You know what? I like greeting cards. Do you know what else? I think I'm talking a little over your heads today. <laughs> Let's pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for miracles, especially the resurrection. Help us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Tagore was a poet in India, the country of India. And of course, if you are in an upper caste in India, you were almost required to have a servant. And servants were, of course, uh, very inexpensive. And Tagore had a servant. And the servant was late one day. And it just irritated Tagor. And he wound up being about an hour late. And as the minutes ticked, Tagor just became more and more irritated that his servant was being lazy, getting there late. So he made up his mind that he was going to fire his servant. The servant comes in, doesn't say a word, just starts his duties, starts sweeping the floor. And after he was doing that for a while, Tagore goes up to him and says, pack up your things and get out. You are fired. And Tagore said, the servant just kept sweeping. And after a long silence, he said, my little girl died last night. What that story teaches us is that what the world really needs from us, from one another, is compassion. Compassion. We all need it. Of course, sometimes we think the church is about truth. But they need the truth, don't they? They need, the, need compassion, first and foremost. William Galston He's a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and he suggests that what happens, what has happened in America, we have found how thin the veneer of tolerance and kindness is. And he said, we have found that. It's a thin veneer that can get broken easily, and then all the ugliness pops up. And he said, it has, we've come to this realization through the harsh politics we've seen. He writes this. We believed that changes in law and public norms had gradually brought about changes in private attitudes across partisan and ideological lines. We thought that long-standing racial and ethnic prejudices had been marginalized. 
we hoped that the most religious population in any Western democracy would deal compassionately with the suffering of refugees from war-torn nations, whatever their religion. We assumed that some beliefs had moved so far beyond the pale that those who continued to hold them would not dare to say so publicly. And then, speaking of how fragile tolerance is, he writes, the critique, the critique of political correctness has destroyed many taboos and has given many licensed to say whatever they think. Very thin veneer. You poke it and a lot of ugliness comes out. What people need from us is compassion. This widow, there's a lot of reasons to be compassionate about her. She lost her husband, lost her son, lost her status and identity, lost her only son. Of course, women in Jesus' day in the first century, they lived. They found their life and livelihood through the men around them. And when she lost her son, now this wasn't a little boy, he was probably a teenager, maybe late teens. Everything her husband had passed down to him. Now she really had nothing. Jesus comes and changes all that. He first has compassion. This word compassion, it's a physical wrenching in the gut. It, it's a word that's rarely used. It's only used in the New Testament. It's used three times in Luke. George Buttrick says of it, it is compassion. It is the pain of love. The pain of love. Three times in Luke. It's used in the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan had this kind of compassion for the man he found in the ditch. A gut-wrenching, his heart really went out to the man. The father, in the story of the, good, of the prodigal son, when he sees his son coming home and he sees him off in a distance, he had this kind of compassion, a feeling of wrenching in the gut, the pain of love, and he went running to meet him something that wasn't proper for men in his culture to do, to run to meet his son. Notice the woman, there's no suggestion she had faith. There's no suggestion. She even asked Jesus to help her. If you remember last week, Jesus was in Capernaum, 25 miles away, had healed the servant of the centurion. Now walked 25 miles, one day's journey, a crowd following him, and they meet the crowd coming from town going to bury this young man. Jesus then touched the beer and said, young man, rise. What a lucky break, says Ted to Rick, that Jesus should run into this guy's funeral procession. And Rick says, but it's not just for him or for his mom. It's a sign that God has visited all of us to overcome death for us. And of course, Ted has to have the last word. Wow, that is a lucky break. But God has visited all of us, overcome death for us. Audrey Gustafson, our bishop, said in a, a sermon on a different text, he said, it is undeniable that we are stuck with the resurrection. We are stuck with Easter. And we could say that that's what, exactly what this text is saying to us. We are stuck as Easter people 
with the resurrection. And what does that mean for us? Diane Comp was a doctor. She was a pediatric oncologist. She was an agnostic. Did not know whether or not God exists. Didn't worry too much about it. She was at the bedside of a young girl, Anne. Anne was dying of leukemia. The chaplain was called in because she was near death. The chaplain, Anne, Anne's Christian parents, Dr. Comp, were all there at the bedside. And then Diane Comp writes this. Anna mustered the final energy to sit up in her hospital bed and say, The angels, they're so beautiful, Mommy. Can you see them? Do you hear them singing? They're so beautiful, Mommy. Then she lay back on her pillow and died. The chaplain, isn't it funny how clergy sometimes respond to these moments? The chaplain was uncomfortable with that, so he left. I find that funny. He left. So there you've got now the agnostic Dr. Comp with these two devout Christian parents with Anna, or Anne, who had just died. She was con confronted, Dr. Comp, with the fact of the resurrection. And she knew at that moment something had to change. She ceased to be an agnostic. She believed. Well, God has visited us in Christ to overcome death for us. And because of that, Dr. Diane Comp realized that we are stuck with Easter and something needs to change. Her faith changed. We too were confronted with the resurrection. We're resurrection people. And that means something for us all personally in our personal lives. But it also means we act now in any way we can, in compassionate ways. At our assembly this week, they emphasized certain things that the ELCA was about, and I'm just going to talk about three of them. One is the malaria campaign. Do you realize we've exceeded our goal of raising $15 million to fight malaria? And we've done so primarily in African countries, Angola, Namibia, Zambia, uh, Uganda, South Sudan, Mozambique. Why do we do things like that? Well, we've been confronted with the resurrection. So we reach out in any way we can. In uh, Garden City, the fastest growing church in our synod happens to be in Garden City, Kansas. Can you imagine that? Way out there in western Kansas, down in the southwestern corner. I, there's no garden there, in my opinion. Garden City. It's a Hispanic ministry. It's a new ministry. Just started a few years ago. And it's, to show you how thriving it is, 45 students in confirmation. 45. What a headache, right? I have trouble with six. And then, uh, and here's the beauty of being part of the ELCA, by the way. 
you and I can't be in Garden City. It wouldn't be practical. But we can through the ELCA. Third thing I'd like to mention is, uh, and I realize this is a political issue, that because parents are so concerned about their children in South America and in some countries where there's dictatorships and uh, killing going on, they send their children on ahead hoping they can make it to the United States. They become, uh, they're called unaccompanied minors. Well, it's unsafe for them to be unaccompanied minors. You and I can't go down to Nicaragua or Guatemala to be with these children. But we can through the ELCA. Our church is there, helping those children, and sometimes and often helping them find their way back to their parents. So all those things happen. Why? Because we know God has visited us, visited each of us with the resurrection with the resurrection and helps us deal every day with death in our lives. And now we try as best we can to deal with death in this world. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe. Let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Giver of joy, make your presence known in this congregation. Give us such a clear and bold share of your spirit that your life and vitality shine through us into our neighborhood. Lord, in your mercy. God of the living and the dead, work in your creation and work through us in such ways that lead to life for your creation and for all people. Lord, in your mercy. God of the city, we pray for cities, urban areas, suburbs, small towns, and all communities. We lift up all who have suffered losses through storms, tornadoes, or floods, those suffering from the ravages of war and those suffering from famine or drought. Renew their spirits, give them strength, and help them find the assistance they need to rebuild their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate healer. Send your healing to the sick, especially Darlene Aaron, Terry Carlson, Pam Cole, Lucy and Lyle Dolly, Sandy Drake, Daniel Everett, Ron Fells, Jeff Hemphill, David Jones, Alan Caymans, Ellen Lassant, Paula Merkley, Chris Marquardt, Willis Melgren, Eddie Miner, Gail Moffitt, Norma Mueller, Carolyn Nyes, Lynn Peterson, Benita Stamper, and Lucy Stilwell. Are there any others? God of life, gather us with all your saints in the promise of life forever with you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for that Mary Lou Fisher has received her heart transplant. We also thank you for those who have gone before us. We pray that you comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Joe Boyce, of Jane Crisman, and of Dr. Moravad Karimi. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting your promise to hear us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. God of The Lord be he with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our, indeed, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who proclaimed good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. O oh God, as a mother comforts her child, so you comfort your people, carrying us in your arms and satisfying us with this food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Send us now as your disciples, announcing peace and proclaiming that the reign of God has come near, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. I'm going to invite you to be seated for a couple of minutes. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. Vi Sims on Thursday turned 99. So uh, if you haven't dropped her a card, do that. 99. She was in church last night, by the way. Also in church, we've had them in our prayers for a long time. Lucy. Uh, Dolly had a stroke a few months back, and Lyle ha continues to um, have a progressive uh, neurological disease that has been undiagnosed. But Lyle and Lucy Dolly were in church last night. Uh, something to rejoice about. Um, and I hear our um, Relay for Life went well, and that Messiah people. Uh, raised thousand dollars or so, which was a good uh, good thing. And read your messenger about the upcoming car wash that the youth are doing. Dick is going to tell you about what you can do right now. Continental breakfast uh, in the uh, narthex. Just trying to make sure it's on. Uh, it seems to be. Okay. Let me see. Does it say mute? It, it says this does not work for Dick Peterson. <laughs> now I'll try it. Okay. Better. All right. So anyway. Uh, we're celebrating today. We've been able to give over $10,000 in endowment funds, which we are announcing today. Those in, uh, include security cameras, a monitor to go up in the rear of the sanctuary, vestibule door in the daycare, and youth funds for Tomashinga. Also, we have Lutheran World Relief Funds, uh, LCA Women Funds, and a Holland School Backpack Program. So those total up to be over $10,000, and that's a cause for celebration. But that's not the only good news, is we still have about $10,000 that we can spend, but it has to be in a different category. It must be an outreach, either to the Synod or here in the community. So I encourage everyone to think outreach, and in September or October, we will again open up applications for endowment grants for those categories. So uh, these things must originate with a member of the congregation. So just talk it up among yourselves and uh, see what the, you uh, might come up with with ideas that we could make a real impact in the community or in the world. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you that we always need endowment funds. So uh, during endowment month, we hope that you'll remember the fund. It now has over $400,000 in it, uh, of which the principal amount cannot be spent. It must be 
uh, saved in that principal amount. But as that increases, it allows us to give bigger and larger grants every year. So uh, that being said, uh, we've got a little brunch for you out in the narthex. I hope everyone can come, particularly the youth from New Braunfels. I know the cafeteria over in King's House is not too good, so uh, be sure, <laughs> sure and join us for that. So thank you. Thank you, Dick, for all your work with the endowment committee as well as all the other endowment people. I don't have anything else to say. I'm sure you're thankful for that. Please rise and receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Guided by the gospel.